start out um, by asking you how you felt about the recent Supreme Court ruling on SB 1070 in Arizona. The fact that it clarified that um, immigration policy is you know, federal law, I think, was incredibly important. The, the part that is disappointing, that it upheld the part that some people are calling show me your papers portion of SB 1070 is something that um, is going to be questioned, I'm sure, in the, in the future, with future cases being brought to the Supreme Court, that this is a policy that cannot really be enforced um, without some element of racial profiling, just at a practical level. Um, police officers making judgments about who looks undocumented. I don't see how you could do that without, without eliciting some level of prejudice or or racial profiling. So this is an ongoing issue that at some level the court wanted to say this is sort of a practical matter as opposed to a legal matter. But um, yeah, just uh, you know, having talked to Chief Dean and um, Police Executive Research Forum and people and police uh, chiefs and sheriffs across the country, we've you know we've been able to show the the film to them and had this discussion about how do you actually enforce this? And so I, there's a lot of discussion even in the Supreme Court arguments during in April that talked a lot about the practical aspects of our immigration policy and that's something I would love to really explore in the future is not just you know the policy in abstract but the in practice how is it actually enforced in our country and this is really what affects people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis, how it's actually for, for enforced, not what's, what's on the books. So it's a, it's a very um, difficult, you know, I think, situation because uh, I wish that they had basically said we can't do the no, no papers, show me your papers portion of SB 1070, but they didn't do that. So, you know, well, we'll, I, we'll I thought it was actually a good decision. Mm -hmm. um, they, could, they couldn't strike down the racial profiling mandate uh, in an election year. I, th I think that they were concerned that that would impact Mitt Romney negatively. Uh, the way I read the decision, they said, we'll strike that part of the law down after the election. Um, they, what they said is the Justice Department has asked us to review whether or not this law conflicts with the supremacy clause of the Constitution, and we judge that it does. However, the mandate to check immigration status based on appearance um, does not does not violate the supremacy clause because the federal government and local governments already work together in secure communities and using um, uh, what is the other one called Annabelle? I don't know. Uh, well, there's already co coll collaboration between local mm -hmm. government and federal government um, um, on immigration, and so the racial profiling question the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution question was not asked by the Justice Department. They did not challenge it based on racial profiling. And what the Supreme Court basically said is, is this decision does not preclude you from coming back as soon as there's a legal resident or citizen of the United States who has cause to show that they were held unlawfully or they were held uh, for uh, an additional amount of time because of their appearance, uh, because they speak Spanish or because they appear to be an immigrant, that would be a violation of their constitutional rights. And basically, they said, we'll strike that part of the law down after the election. I don't know if it was that clear. I mean, I didn't necessarily well, well, reach that back, conclusion. Um, come, come back in a year and you'll see. That okay. as, as soon as somebody comes to them and says, basically, the ACLU, the Justice Department, everybody will join. You know, the, the former governor of Arizona is a Latino man, and he's been... Mm -hmm detained three times uh, mm. in Arizona. Uh, as soon as somebody comes with the best case to challenge the law, the Supreme Court will strike it down, I predict, six to three. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. In your film, we see how you really transition from being documentarians to participants or activists, if you will. And I'm wondering, what can people who are moved by your film do to help temper the hatred and fear that exists around this issue of immigration? And how can ordinary citizens really play a role in the conversation? Yeah, well, I think the first thing is really figure out you know, how we can have a fact-based conversation about this um, and really challenge people who use very strong rhetoric and make a lot of assumptions 
that um, really are unfounded. Like, for instance, that um, illegal immigrants, like people, the rhetoric is, or illegals commit crime, that they're seen as somehow being associated with cr cr crime as criminals. And I think that is something that has to get challenged at every single level because that's just not true. Um, and, and the fact that, um, you know, being out of status or not, or being undocumented is not a crime, it's a civil violation, right? That, again, that's a legal distinction, but it's a very important one because psychologically people think, oh, okay, so people who are undocumented are criminals and therefore they don't have rights. So it leads to this kind of slippery slope that dehumanizes people who are out of status. So that's another thing I think that I, I would love for people to challenge at every level, that these things are, really get in the way of having reasonable immigration policy that makes sense. I mean, the, the other thing that we didn't explore in the film that I think people really need to know, and if there's, you know, if we do a follow-up to this film, I would, you know, really focus on this, is how um, the prison industry has been really behind Arizona's SB 1070. You know, by by inciting fear um, and hatred, they were basically creating an, a a, a for-profit model, making money off of detaining immigrants, including children, right? And so that the fact that that's behind SB 1070 and probably other state laws like it is incredibly frightening and troubling, and that I think everyone should be upset about that. You know, no matter what your stance on immigration is, people shouldn't be making immigration policy based on, you know, desire for some people to make money off of detaining them. You know, right. So I, th I think, you know, really insisting on fact-based conversations, we encourage people to have kind of town hall meetings. We encourage people to do what Eric and I did, create a YouTube channel and really upload and document videos that, that show what, what, the issue is really about in their community, you know, and, and getting different voices involved. And ultimately, and we saw this in Mississippi, there was a very effective coalition, as including, you know, uh, religious leaders that basically stood up together and said, this is wrong. And they didn't go into all the politics of it. They just simply said, this is wrong, and this does not reflect our values. And they were able to stop the Mississippi law that was kind of on this train, fast train, to being passed just like in Alabama. So I think having that that coalition like you saw in the film is absolutely critical for political success. If you really want to stop the bill, you have to create a, a coalition that includes faith-based leaders and other community leaders and not just immigrants. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I guess I could just add, the, the, it really is bad when the private prison industry and ALEC are driving legislation on law enforcement. First of all, you don't want to politicize law enforcement because mm -hmm. what that does is it undermines the ability of your police and sheriff's departments to keep your community safe. Um, they have a science, they have, a, they have an approach to police work that involves relationships of trust with all elements of the community, as Chief Dean says in the film. And so when you have politicians and profiteers changing police policy in order to suit their electoral or financial interests, it really is unfair to the taxpayers because we pay money into our state and local governments in order to pay for mm -hmm. public safety, not for electioneering and not for private pr prison industry profits. And what ha what's happening with this uh, private prison industry through ALEC, uh, the now famous American Legislative Exchange Council, that recommended the law that says stand your ground if you're holding a gun and the other guy isn't, you can shoot him and get away with it law. Um, they're also the ones who pushed SB 1070 in Arizona. And what that essentially means is that Arizona taxpayers will be paying into the tax base and that money will be extracted directly to the private prison industry instead of going to roads, transportation, education, or public safety, their taxpayer dollars would be going to these private profiteers who feed, bed, clothe, and provide medical care for all of these undocumented immigrants who were previously productive members of society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an issue that we see in your film um, that I feel was represented really well is the economic impacts of immigration and a resolution like this. And can you talk a little bit about how people can 
move the conversation beyond immigration as a social issue um, to talking about other factors. Yeah, so I, th I definitely think that's where the conversation really needs to go, is a more holistic view about the immigration issue so that it's not just a social, cultural, racial issue. Um, and it, it really is something that um, affects all Americans. You know, not only because of our heritage as immigrants, I'm, I'm an immigrant for instance, Eric's families definitely are recent immigrants. Um, I mean, so given that um, that is part of identity, I, I, I don't, I, I think that, you know, the important part that has really been missing is the economic factor here. If you look at just the economic analysis for comprehensive immigration reform, you know, we we stand to really prosper as a nation once we're able to really you know, unleash the people who are, as they say, living in the shadows or who are undocumented. I think if we were able to unleash them as an economic force and really acknowledge that they're already part of our economy, right? as not only laborers, but as consumers, as homeowners, and so on. You know, once we see how interconnected our lives are already, then we, we, we'll be able to accept the truth, which is that comprehensive immigration reform will help us reduce our deficit and help us prosper. That's just the that's just the reality. But because there's so much rhetoric and so much misinformation, I think people get stuck saying, "But they shouldn't be here, and they're taking our jobs, and uh, they're criminals." They just get so stuck, you know, in that mindset that somehow it's a category of people that need to be somehow expelled from this country. But really, they are part of America and they're part of our economy, and that's uh, something we just have to accept. Yeah, I guess I could add to that and say that, you know, there are other nations on this earth that also had a baby boom after World War II. And those countries also have what, what we have, is, which is a very dangerous ratio between people who are of retirement age or soon to reach retirement age and the people who are actually working and generating um, our gross national product and tax dollars to fuel our government. So. What we're facing right now is, is that the baby boomer generation is retiring and we know the cost of medical care and the cost of social security is going to be un basically untenable as we have so many people who are in, of retirement age receiving social security benefits and not enough people paying in, into it. So the only way for us to have a growing economy that's strong enough to support the kind of country we want to be where you know our parents and grandparents don't get thrown out on the street to die is to have a growing population, a growing workforce, to be the nation of immigrants that we were before September 11th, before the, the fear that that event um, you know, brought to our country was exploited for political purposes and created this whole anti-immigrant hysteria that we've had for the past 10 years. It's had negative impact on our, on our economy, as we can see. But in, the most important thing to say is that if we can re regain our brand, as the nation of immigrants, as the land of opportunity, and begin to attract all of those ideas and those entrepreneurs, all those business, uh, st those business owners, or those people who who start new businesses, um, all those really hardworking, motivated people to increase that ratio of workers to re retirees. That's how we balance our budget. That's how we restore the fiscal solvency of our government. That's how we build the American economy. And we just have to say to those people who are focused on the ethnic backgrounds of the immigrants and what percentage of us are white and what percentages of us are not white. It's just not as important as our nation's economic security. We need to stop thinking of immigration law as a way to preserve the white majority. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, as in general, I want to add that, you know, we have a lot of fear-based policymaking that's been going on, especially after 9-11. And the fact that the um, anti-immigrant lobby was able to tie our fears about security, national security with immigration from south of the border. The fact that they were able to do that um, and made you know, immigrants people to fear and made immigration a national security issue, that was the biggest coup. You know that they were able to engineer, and I think we need to take back our, you know, our our policy making from them because this is this is can't be based on fear. 
It has to be based on facts. It has to be based on our values. You know, we can't shrink in fear when it's it's not even founded in the truth. I mean, we're creating, turning them, vilifying them, and somehow making them um, scapegoats for a lot of problems in, in our country. And as you saw in Prince William County, that ends up hurting everyone. And I really do want us to change our outlook for, at the, especially at the federal level, that you know we we have got to figure out how we can talk about this by looking at facts and and recalling what our values are and who we are, as opposed to just you know just letting that part of our primal part of the brain, <laughs> you know, do the policy making here. So I'd like to read uh, two opposing viewer comments that we've received and uh, get your feedback. The first is from Jorge from California, and Jorge says, <laughs> the words illegal aliens are intended to dehumanize immigrants who come to this country primarily in search of work opportunities that are not found in their countries of origin. Immigrants are human beings, and human beings are not illegal. Americans need to feel compassion for immigrants who contribute to society with their hard work. Let's also de they also deserve an opportunity. What would it be like to be in their shoes? Let's stop humiliating them. And the second comment is from Demel in Alabama. Human beings entering a sovereign country illegally is illegal, hence the use of the term. Alien refers to them being foreign, but a more proper use could be illegal immigrant. Nevertheless, open borders is not a feasible is not feasible for a sovereign nation. Even Mexico has strict rules against illegal immigrants. Let's stop pandering to a feel-good theory when in practice, open borders is full of dire consequences. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I, let me start with the open borders part, Annabelle, and then you can talk about the dehumanizing rhetoric and, and what, mm -hmm. what, what the purposes of that. Um, you know, we essentially did have open borders until 1882 when there began to be immigration hysteria or anti-immigrant hysteria over the number of Chinese people, including some of my ancestors, uh, who were coming to the United States to build railroads uh, or to chase the, um, the gold rush. And so we passed this law in 1882 called the Chinese Exclusion Act. Up until that point, we did have open borders, and we were doing all right. I mean, the country wasn't collapsing. Um, there, there, there wasn't, I don't know, disease or... Uh, plague or, you know, we did have a civil war, but I don't think we can blame that on immigrants. I mean, it's just not true that if we were to go back to, um, well, let's just say, it's just not true if we were to let go of the era of using immigration law to try to preserve the white majority as we had between 1882 and the 1960s civil rights era, that something bad would happen. It's just not true. The I understand that there are people who were born before the civil rights era and lived before the civil rights era, and they probably still think of immigration law that way. But we have passed legislation that says we are not supposed to use immigration law for those, for you know, essentially as a ethnic preference um, uh, you know, policy. So what we need to do is we need to adjust our immigration law in order to meet the demands, the labor demands of a growing economy. We need to adjust our immigration law so that America can compete on a global level and kind of re reassert, reassert ourselves as the nation of immigrants in the land of opportunity. The idea of who is Hispanic and who's white and all that stuff, we have to let go of that and just embrace the diversity and the dynamic economy that we have because of that diversity. Yeah, um, yeah. This is definitely the the hardest part about making the film, <laughs> and the hardest part about this issue is the dehumanizing um, rhetoric that is thrown around uh, that um, is chilling in many cases because um, you know it it allows people to to go in that direction, and we heard this in Prince Huron County. We hear we heard in Arizona that that you know these people are of a separate category of human beings and they don't it's like it's not even just that they don't have rights but it's all, uh, they, some people act like they don't even have rights to just live you know that um, you can be you can use the second amendment remedy on them and get into that kind of militia militant attitude towards them that is terrifying 
So we saw this in Prince William County where people talked about taking them out with guns. And, uh, and anyone who supported them also got vilified. We got, you know, vilified. Um, and Eric used to walk around um, with the baseball bat in your, um, what it was, your tripod bag, you know, <laughs> because we were, we were that frightened. So there's a lot of fear to go around here. But I, I guess, you know, I, I just want to remind people that no matter what side of the debate you're on, everyone agrees that our immigration system is broken, right? And, and so instead of, to me, focusing our energy and resources on trying to enforce broken immigration laws, we have to focus on fixing those laws that are broken, fixing the system that's broken. And then we can have a more reasonable enforcement policy. Right now, we don't, our enforcement policy and the rhetoric doesn't fit with the reality. We have too many people in our country already who are you know, undocumented. We can't deport them all. So that whole, you know, rhetoric of deport them all, I mean, that's, you know, that doesn't, you know, that just doesn't make sense. Even if you want to think that we can do it, we don't have the capacity to do it, you know. And so we have to be realistic and get beyond the rhetoric and get beyond, well, you know, they committed a crime and therefore they don't, they shouldn't be here. You know, we, we have got to insist on saying, okay, what are you saying here? What are you willing to do? How much money are you willing to pay in order to deport all people who are undocumented? And so if you ask them for specifics, like how much is this going to cost, right? And just like Prince William County had to do, how much is this going to cost me? How is, is it going to raise my taxes, right? And, you know, the most important scene in the whole film to me is Linda Chavez asking Cora Stewart, what empirical data did you collect to make this argument <laughs> because they don't have the facts the people who want to deport all immigrants or create policies that are meant to harass people who look foreign those policies are not founded in facts it's just founded in fear and rhetoric and opportunism political opportunism right and so we've got to hold people to that. And, and to the you know, person writing in from Georgia, I mean, I understand that it feels wrong, you know, but you have to face the facts here. You know, we have you know, too many people, upwards of 20 million people who could stand to be deported if we really went in, in that direction of let's deport them all. I, um, who's going to pay for that? You know, so like, we have to ask the follow-up questions and not just kind of be okay with, okay, they shouldn't be here. That's not policy making. That's just an attitude. But we have, in order to make policies, we have to ask practical questions about things like who's going to pay for it and can't we fix the laws first before spending money on enforcing broken immigration laws. I think the hard truth is is that re it requires an element of racial resentment to mm -hmm. say that a person deserves to lose their status as a human being for a misdemeanor. Um, people have speeding tickets in this country. Um, there are mattresses and pillows that come with tags that say it's illegal to remove them. We had an, we had an economic collapse. Okay, We had an economic collapse because of illegal and immoral behavior on Wall Street. And we decided not to enforce those laws. We decided not to bring those people to justice because it was impractical. It was impractical. Wall Street is a branch of government in this country, and they're very powerful, probably more powerful than any of the other three. And we could not enforce um, laws that would protect us from the next financial collapse. We could not uh, bring people to justice because it just wasn't practical. It might have been even more expensive uh, than than the bailout. So. There are many things that are illegal, there are many things that are wrong, um, but when we make policy, we do have to think in the, in the real world of um, how, much, how much resources are willing to apply towards something that ultimately hurts the economy, hurts the fiscal solvency of the government, and hurts public safety. In Prince William County, we ultimately decided that, yes, this was a strong election issue, but now that the election is over and we see how the policy is impacting the county, hurting public safety, hurting the local, government, uh, local economy and hurting the fiscal solvency of the government, it wasn't worth it. I mean, the resentment only carries you so far. At the end of the day, you need other emotions, you need other things in your life to have a, a, a good quality of life. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, there. You know, we. I. I want to. Um. You know, I want to kind of. You know, talk to a little bit more to the person who wrote in from Georgia. I mean, I don't mean to say that you're completely wrong. I mean, I do understand where you're coming from, and I. I. I but I really encourage you to look at what our existing immigration policy is before getting into the position of saying we should throw everything at just enforcing our laws because it really isn't serving us you know we have comp we have policies that really don't make sense you know we we don't have a line that's another thing that people say a lot is like get get in line there is no line for low wage low skilled workers are you kidding? We can't even get the ones who are, who are educated here to stay. Our immigration system is so broken that we can't feed our economy these people that we educate here. They come here from other countries and then we lose them because we don't have the, the visas that we need to keep them. There are actually entrepreneurship boats offshore, off the shore of California in order so that, that these entrepreneurs, these people who could be creating jobs in America can innovate and they do it on a boat and people, Americans, go out to work with them on boats because we can't fix our immigration system yeah. in order to meet the needs of a growing economy. We yeah. have to allow things like the economy and public safety and, and fiscal responsibility to, to take a higher priority than fear or anger toward people who look and sound different. Yeah, but I, I think the burden really should be on the lawmakers. You know, we almost passed comprehensive immigration reform in 2006. We have to get back into that place where we're really looking at solutions to the problem. And so the, you know, we shouldn't expect everyone to know all the details about immigration. You know, why should everyone know that if you, um, if you enact these kinds of policies that you're going to have farms that actually have to move to Mexico because they can't afford to pay workers. And then we, you know, end up losing their, the taxes that we would get from that. So there are so many things that are part of the equation here. We can't expect anyone off the street to know these things, but the lawmakers need to insist on talking about this using facts and really looking for solutions together instead of submitting to all this rhetoric and you know and let me tell you I mean you know the the lobbyists behind you know bad immigration policy like you, you have to really look at you know how, how we can really follow the money on this you know people who are introducing state level policies um, are almost all of them getting money from people who stand to benefit? You know, this is this is this is corruption at a basic level. And so, you know, I think that is what everyone should understand: is that the policies that people are being that are being introduced have pro for profit interests behind it. And that's why you should all be just critical and demand Congress come to some. You know, agreement about how we can how we can go forward as a country with realistic, reasonable immigration policy. So it, it sounds like you've already answered this, but I'd like to hear a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see Prince William County as a microcosm of what's going on across the country, or do you feel like it was more there are more unique situations in specific locations? Well, Prince William County is right is a bit of, of a ground zero of it's a swing state. It's a swing county in a swing state. So it's probably more political. It has kind of a more political um, it's sort of a political stage more than many other areas of the country. And so the fact that, you know, of course Stewart knew that he would get a lot of national press. Um, for um, introducing this policy, I think, made Prince William County unique. But it is a microcosm in the sense that the 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 you know this is this is a very dynamic situation here. You know, of people who really do not know how to deal with demographic changes in their community, and this is something that you're seeing all across the country. There are enormous demographic shifts going on. Right, many counties and cities becoming majority minorities, where you have more minorities and Caucasians. 
you know, that fact, you know, is something that will require us being able to, in a mature way, have dialogue about this. These are changes that scare people that again affect that part of the brain that makes us scared and I think um, you know be, we need leadership among community leaders to really figure out how we can talk about this so that you know we can make these adjustments instead of people sort of getting divisive and divided and, and politicians who find political opportunity in this. We just can't afford to continue like this. We can't afford these divisions that are based on fear. And so I guess in that sense, Prince William County is a microcosm. Um, and I, I would love to see people in your audience, people across the country, people like us, who are just, um, who care about our country and our community to step up and take on leadership in creating space for dialogue where we can be candid with each other and look for facts and solutions together. We have to create that space. Otherwise, you know, it's going to feel more militant. It's going to feel like, you know, war in some places. We just, you know, like Prince William County, there were moments I thought, we could have a civil war over the immigration issue. You know, and that that is frightening, that we could have another sort of, you know, cultural war so ugly that some people will become violent. And so this is why we need leadership. So to everybody who is watching or will watch later, please consider how you can take on leadership on this issue because it is going to affect our future in every way, all of us. There are a couple parallels. And, you know, the, the first of them is uh, whether it's immigration or any other issue, when people organize around hatred, it has a chilling effect on a community or a country or a democracy, as we have seen, it leaves us vulnerable to manipulation by those powerful media entities that have a captive audience of people who thrive on conflict and are motivated by resentment or fear. So I think that at the national level, not long after we made 9500 Liberty, there was another wave of hate-based uh, electioneering and politics. Uh, I think that's why the coffee party uh, was sort of a natural step for us to do to basically try to use the same tactics to counter those who organize around hatred with being civil, with being fact-based, with being solutions-oriented, and yes, being diverse and being open to diverse perspectives and diverse cultures. Those are all the markers of the Coffee Party, which Annabelle did found, as you mentioned, uh, with a sim simple Facebook post. And what's remarkable about, about that is that, like Prince William County, after going through a period of time where our politics and political discourse was dominated by people who were so hateful and so misinformed, it created this sort of potential energy for the rest of the county, in the case of Prince William County, or the rest of the country to at some point say enough is enough, whether it's frightening or not to confront people who organize around hatred, it's even more frightening to abdicate our government, our right to self-governance to those people and to those powerful media empires that manipulate those people. And I think that's the struggle we're now having as a country, which Prince William County did resolve. We did, you saw Republicans and Democrats step up together to face down extremism. You saw the business community and the law enforcement community and the religious community band together to stand up against extremism. And that's what I think we need to do as a country as well. Republicans and Democrats are finding we have a lot more in common with each other than either one of us have with extremists. And we're finding that across the ethnic lines, Hispanics, Blacks, Latinos, Asians, Native Americans, and, and Caucasian Americans, we all have more in common. We have more at stake in an, an inclusive, forward-looking America. And there are very few of us, very, very few, a tiny, hyperbolic, extreme, and, and, and very much... Um, bloated in terms of the, their representation, that minority of people who want to go back to the America that we had when there was a certain level of white racial prestige, that tiny minority who want to go back to the America we had when only a few plutocrats, the billionaires and millionaires and their children, had control over job creation and whether our economy could move forward or not. We can't live in that world anymore. It's not productive. It's not it's not good for our economic well-being. It's not good for our global competitiveness to go backwards. We have to move forward because whether we move forward or not, the rest of the world will. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, the last thing um, you know, I want to add is, um, you know, to get to go, to go back to this point about our values and our overall perspective on this thing. And Eric brought this up earlier: is that you know we um, had a financial collapse in two thousand and eight. That was man-made. It was not a natural disaster. You know, people um, made horrible decisions that were, in many cases, illegal, right? And I think um, this is, I'm talking about the Wall Street. And, you know, there really hasn't been enough investigation and accountability of that. But instead of really looking for accountability, instead of actually seeking you know, just punishment of the people who, who destroyed our economy, um, you know, we rewarded them, you know, we gave them bonuses, right? And then instead, we're looking at people who are here and as undocumented workers who do help, you know, uh, stabilize our social security and who contribute to our economy, who built our homes, who cook our meals, who, who you know, clean our offices and homes. I mean, we are punishing them for not having documentation, you know. And so to me, like, it's just so lopsided. Like, the people who really need, need to be punished are, are re being rewarded because we see them as job creators, even though they put millions of people into poverty, you know. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and immigrants are so driven. They work, they do work hard and they're very driven. They are the job creators, many of them. Are their job creators, and so so we we've got things backwards in so many ways, and mm -hmm. I think um, you know all those Republicans who talk about small businesses, you know, I and mean, that's in many cases those are the immigrants. Immigrants are, for, small immigrants are are immigrants are forty percent more likely to start a new business than people who are born here. And they hire people, and they they contribute to our economy and the tax base. So again, like I implore people to actually look at the facts instead of just getting stuck on these words and categories. And you know, understand that you know, in order for us to have a strong America again, we have to be able to talk to each other without screaming at each other, without being so close-minded that we can't hear the truth. And we can't hear each other, and so so that's what I would like you know really to focus on for like the next steps is figuring out how to create that dialogue so we can talk to each other and and sort out the facts and be be reasonable about this. Absolutely. And Eric, you mentioned the coffee party, and I think all of our viewers are really interested in hearing more about that. And in fact, we have a specific question here from a viewer, and they want to know if the coffee party is endorsing either presidential candidate. Uh, well, no, we won't be endorsing a candidate. The coffee party organizes around issues. Our three primary issues are tax code reform, Wall Street reform, and campaign finance reform. And I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, I said that there are people who are motivated by fear and anger, and they're sort of a captive audience to what I call 1% media. These are media products that require millions and billions of dollars to operate and disseminate. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the agendas that are presented to uh, consumers of those media products tend to benefit the 1%. They tend to benefit polluters who don't want to have to abide by our laws because it hurts their profits when they abide by, the, by our laws. Um, it, they recommend policies that benefit very, very wealthy people who don't want to pay uh, the tax rates that we had when our economy was strong and our budget was balanced during the 90s. They don't want to go back to those tax rates because it would cut into their profits. And so what happens is that 1% media products say to their consumers, you might be angry at immigrants or maybe angry at gay people or just angry in general, but here's how to channel that anger. Protect the special tax bonus bonuses of wealthy people and protect the rights of large corporations to pollute our water and pollute our air. In other words, pr protect the profits of the 1%. Profits are more important than people. And what the Coffee Party is trying to say is that the definition of patriotism is not love of profits. It's love of country, and it's love of the people in this country that matters most. That's what real patriotism is. And so when we look at economic issues, which we do quite a bit, tonight I'll be on Coffee Party Radio 8 p.m. Eastern talking about poverty with Michael Charney, who is a moderate Republican. He's the author of the book Chasing Glenn Beck. He's famous for a Twitter war with Glenn Beck and, and Glenn Beck consumers. 
But what we try to do in the coffee party is we use products like this. This is a 99% media product. We're doing this for free. And we may not be reaching the numbers of people that a, a Fox News, for instance, or a Rush Limbaugh could reach, but the people that we do reach through social media, they're so much more active and involved and engaged than people who simply sit back and consume essentially political advertising disguised as news. We are producers of content, not just consumers of content in the Coffee Party. And what we have, if you go to coffeepartyusa.com slash radio hyphen coffee or coffeepartyusa.com slash social hyphen media, then you'll see the ways in which we're using blog talk radio, we're using live stream, we'll soon be on television as well. Uh, and if we're using a new product called Scoop It. And of course, Facebook, if you go to facebook.com slash coffee party, there are 1,400, no, sorry, 418,000 people uh, in a network there who are talking about politics in a fact-based, transpartisan, and civil way. And just as it, it was able to heal, heal Prince William County and help that county to repeal the racial profiling mandate, um, I think that that approach is going to heal uh, this country and allow us to move into the 21st century, embrace the 21st century economy. And Coffee Party is just a small part of, of this global, uh, but especially importantly here, uh, this national movement. Yeah, um, I'm, I want to summarize both um, Coffee Party and 9500 Liberty, like what we, I think, try to do with the film. Um, it's really an invitation for everyone, ordinary people, people who feel marginalized from the process, like for everyone. It's an invitation for you to take on leadership. You know, so this is why I, you know, even though I am passionate about voter engagement and voting, and 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 you know, I'm not, I definitely don't agree with um, a lot of people in the Occupy movement who say we shouldn't vote because it's meaningless. I definitely think we should vote, but having said that, I think what we need now more than ever is citizens and people in America saying, I need to be involved in the process. And so that's what this is all about to me, is for everyone not to shirk the responsibility and say someone else will figure this out or someone else will report it, is that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this very clear, all of you now have official permission you know, to go out and become citizen journalists and get the truth out, get the facts out, whether or not you're just retweeting or you're, um, you know, creating content like Eric and I did or combination, you, it's your responsibility now to get the truth out because that's the only way our democracy is going to work is if people know what the truth is and we're all in a search for the truth. And so, so it's an invitation for you to be part of the democracy that we have that's fragile right now, that's really shaky right now. And unless you get involved in it, it's going to it's going to expire. You know, so so please consider, you know, in your own way what you can do to contribute to the democracy that we have that we need to keep. So, thank you. <laughs> On that note, I'd really like to thank Annabelle and Eric for joining us and to just remind everyone that a great way to participate in our democracy is, <laughs> is to buy a copy of 9500 Liberty and share it with all your friends and family and start those fact-based conversations because that's really how we'll, we'll get this dialogue moving in the right direction. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to spreading the word about your important film. Yeah, thank you so much, Layla. Thank, thank you, Layla. You. Airwaves, a global channel of uncompromising stories. World news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.